and welcome to the Cuyahoga County Progressive Caucus September meeting. Uh, this month, we are featuring folks from the People's Budget, PBCLE, who are going to explain a little bit about uh, what PB is all about, um, and then answer your questions. Um, just a few little housekeeping chores before you know we get to PBCLE. Um, first of all, my name is Steve Haleko. I'm the political director of the organization. Um, and what we have found through numerous Zooms since the pandemic began is that um, it's best not to put a lot of links in the chat. And so uh, we won't be doing that. But what we will do is we will send a lot of links to you and to anybody who registered for the event but couldn't make it um, in an email tomorrow. And I want to real quick go over you know how that email is going to look. Um, first of all, it's going to have a link for folks to join the Cuyahoga County Progressive Caucus. Um, a lot of folks uh, come to our meetings who aren't members. They saw the topic. They liked it. And uh, hopefully you'll like us too and become a member. Membership is free. All you got to do is fill out um, the application. It, it just ask for some basic information, contact information, and so forth. Um, there will also be a donate link. Um, we are all volunteer funded, all volunteer staffed, and uh, any small contributions that you can make would be greatly appreciated. Um, now, you can also donate. And I, I'm going to move my computer a little bit so you can see and get a really cool new CCPC t-shirt. Um, the, the photo of it in the email will be a little bit clearer, but um, we ask for a $35 donation. It kind of helps us in fundraising and it's a cool t-shirt. If you wear it around, it kind of gets, you know, our name out there a little bit too. Um, there'll also be a link to a recording of this meeting, um, and people who have registered but can't make it might like to see the video, um, and if you're very interested in the PB CLE topic, you have friends that have questions about it, uh, you might, you know, want to share that video with them. There'll be some links to stuff concerning PBCLE. And then there will be links to something that is becoming a main focus of the Cuyahoga County Progressive Caucus. And that is uh, making sure that no public funds are being used uh, for a renovated Brown Stadium or even a new Brown Stadium. Uh, our stance has been no public funds used. Uh, the media has picked up our stance and they've covered our point of view. Uh, but we want to hear from you. We want to make sure that, you know, we're representing the wishes of our membership. So this survey takes about five minutes. Please take a minute to fill it out. Along with that, we have an excellent research staff that prepared some Cleveland Brown Stadium facts. And it goes through the entire history of Brown Stadium funding back from when it was first built. Uh, it chronicles uh, all of the money that's been wasted, all of the money that hasn't come back to the city as promised. Um, and it might be interesting if, you know, if you're interested in this topic uh, to, to take a look at that as well before or after you fill out the survey. Now, upcoming, uh, we have an election November 7th um, and uh, we kicked the Republicans' butts on August 8th, and we need to do it again for issue one. Uh, we also have to get the marijuana legalization initiative passed. Um, we haven't gotten word of a lot of canvases, phone banks, text banking, all of that come in yet. But as soon as we get that information, we will get it out to you. Um, again, that's the primary focus in the next six weeks or so before we get to November 7th. Um, just a little note on the format. Um, Molly Martin from PBCLE is going to start off with a presentation about what PBCLE is all about. Um, 
And then afterwards, we had 10 questions uh, submitted by you guys. And as always, the questions were, were, were brilliant. Um, in fact, when, when Deb and I were looking at them, you know, we had to go back to read the actual text of the amendment. Oh, really? Th this is in there? It was kind of cool. But we're going to ask those 10 questions first, um, and then we'll take questions from the audience, um, either in the chat or if, if you raise your hand, you know, we'll kind of play it by ear as to how many questions we have after the 10. Um, Deb Klein is our tech person. Deb, do you have anything to add? Um, we Everybody will be muted. I don't know if you said this, Steve, I was taking care of another technical um, issue. Everyone will be muted. We are asking that you put your questions in the chat and then I will read them um, for Molly. And that's basically okay. it. Um, without further ado, let me introduce Molly Martin, uh, who is the campaign manager for the PBCLE. Molly, go ahead. Thanks, Steve. I hope people like my joke that your t-shirt matches your couch, but maybe that's just a camera thing and it doesn't. <laughs> no, actually it does. I, I should does. have sat in a different couch, <laughs> but, but I didn't know that. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I also didn't know you had multiple couch options at your house. It's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. Thank you for taking the time for joining. I'm very happy to be on this call. And yeah, I'm happy to talk about the People's Budget Cleveland Ballot Initiative, which is now issue 38. That's been an adjustment for us the last several days since the Board of Elections assigned the Charter Amendment Ballot Initiative an issue number. Um, you know, issue 38 is very much about growing Cleveland residents' voices and how the city prioritizes spending specifically for 2% of the budget. Uh, I've been trying to come up with something kind of pithy for the November election. I saw something on social media that was an acronym, and I'm calling it the ABCs. We're voting yes on abortion. We're voting yes on B for budgets, and we're voting yes on C for THC. And this is about centering, building popular democracy and people power around um, their own bodily autonomy and about how um, decisions that impact their lives are made. I am going to be sharing some slides and I promise you that you know this information I'm sharing, I think is really important to get into some of the, the details of the charter amendment and um, share some information with y'all. But before I do that, um, I am the campaign manager of PB Clee, People's Budget Cleveland, um, but I also work pretty deeply with the Northeast Ohio Coalition for the Homeless. For some of you who don't know, I grew up on the west side of Cleveland in West Park. My parents were bought out by the airport in the mid nineties. Uh, and I went to Fairview schools and I moved back to Cleveland four years ago uh, when my dad unexpectedly passed away. My dad was on house for a time and lived at Stella Maris for a year. And a lot of my time as an adult was spent doing homeless street outreach and doing homeless civil rights work. And when I came back in a little bit of a liminal phase in Cleveland, um, a lot of the community that I found was around building power um, around housing rights and civil rights for people experiencing homelessness. And I was brought into uh, a space with residents of Cleveland representing several neighborhoods on the east and west side during the pandemic to talk about how the city was going to prioritize half a billion dollars coming from the federal government in the midst of the pandemic. And given the fact that Cleveland was given such a large allocation because we're such a large poor city, um, you know, we're also simultaneously looking at the fact that two of three Cleveland residents don't vote and that we have to kind of contend with some of the more difficult realities in our city, that people mistrust local government, that people feel really alienated from their situation, and that part of respecting people's dignity and part of building trust is building new on-ramps to how people can participate. And I think a lot of the values around growing democracy and growing people power has come from that that movement and it's been a great honor to work alongside residents across all 34 neighborhoods of Cleveland who are doing different types of work in the city um, to really ask some of the hard questions about what are the spaces where decisions get made that impact people's lives and what can we do to try and really address some of the systemic reasons about how those decisions get made whether that's at the national level federal level state level down to municipal government um, and how can we do something that helps build trust um, and helps build deeper civic engagement, engagement and democracy in the city. 
Uh, so with that said, I'm going to share my screen. And I have some slides here that I would like to share with y'all. And, and one of those is that uh, the People's Budget Charter Amendment is now called Issue 38. And it's about giving Cleveland residents a say in how our tax dollars are spent. People living in the city of Cleveland, Cleveland will vote on Issue 38 on November 7th. And this would be a charter amendment, which would enable residents of Cleveland to pitch ideas and then vote on proposals for how 2% of Cleveland's budget is spent each year. And I'm a part of a grassroots coalition called People's Budget Cleveland or PB CLE that led a signature collection campaign earlier this summer in June to get this charter amendment on the ballot. And PB CLE represents a, a broader coalition of groups that are committed to building community power and deepening civic engagement beyond elections. And a people's budget would give residents real power to make real decisions over how public dollars get spent. This is a list of some of the community partners who've endorsed our coalition, have been a part of our organizing effort in the last two years from hosting backyard parties to talk about what participatory budgeting the process is, um, organizations that are working on voting rights um, for people who have been marginalized by systems um, and helped collect signatures um, throughout the summer to get the people's budget on the ballot. Uh, Building Freedom Ohio, showing up for racial justice. You know, there are some groups on here that people don't recognize or they might not like think like, oh, this is the most like notable group that I know, but it really aligns with PB Clee's mission, uh, which is to bring people who are not usually participating in public processes, who are doing grassroots efforts and have um, a pulse and, a, and an ear to the ground of what's going on in their neighborhood to be a part of the process and to bring them into coalition with us. I think it's important for folks on this call, for folks who are tuning in, to get a little bit of a timeline about how our coalition started. As I had shared, a lot of the work that we had started came back, uh, started in 2021 when Cleveland received half a billion dollars from the federal government. And during 2021, when there was a municipal election for mayor and for multiple members of city council, there were people on council and then candidate Mayor Bibb had endorsed our coalitions, ask of allocating $30 million of ARPA towards a participatory budgeting process. And that number was equivalent and symbolic to the poverty rate of Cleveland and to the notion that people who are most impacted um, by systemic racism, by poverty in Cleveland should be centered in decision making on why Cleveland got that much money. And over the two years since 2021, we had lobbied members of city council and had pilot legislation equivalent to $5 million of ARPA that was um, endorsed by four women on city council and Mayor Bibb. We presented to the finance committee earlier this year in January. Um, I was on that presentation along with Erica Anthony and Jennifer Lumpkin, who are members of our coalition, and that meeting was attended by all members of city council with the exception of Joe Jones, and those members had talked about why they didn't support participatory budgeting or why they felt, despite the lack of um, voter turnout in Cleveland, that civic engagement needs were met by the representation that currently exists on council, and that legislation was tabled. Um, you know, we met as a coalition soon thereafter and, and had deliberated and had meetings and our coalition unanimously decided to go to the ballot. We felt that the best way to uh, optimize the resources of our coalition was to do something that was more transformative in the way that our city makes budgeting decisions. So we decided to draft charter amendment language with partners and residents of Cleveland to get the people's budget on the ballot. And in mid-July, we qualified for the ballot. And now issue 38 is the issue that will go before Cleveland residents on November 7th. And these are just some photos of some coalition members when we had a rally at City Hall in January um, and from different organizing events around the city that we have done. Um, and for folks who aren't aware, when we were doing a lot of organizing over the last couple of years, the term participatory budgeting does not resonate with a lot of folks. Like we changed our name and kind of rebranded as People's Budget because that was something that resonated with folks when we were talking about the topic of giving residents real power to make real decisions and creating this notion of residents being able to determine their own, their own futures and how participatory budgeting is a process used all over the country. 
um, by residents to determine how public dollars get spent and what we see as a mechanism for how the community invests in itself using a people-driven process. This is a map of cities across the United States that have used participatory budgeting to determine how some funding gets spent. The cities listed here are cities that are currently doing PB processes. Seattle is currently doing a PB process to determine $30 million of their annual budget. Los Angeles is doing a pilot with $9 million under a framework around how they're uh, reframing institutional racism and prioritizing public public funding in specific areas of Los Angeles where uh, there's great need. Uh, New York has been doing participatory budgeting for many years. Nashville allocated 10 million of ARPA this year after a $5 million pilot last year. PB first came to the United States in Chicago in 2008. And a lot of cities such as Grand Rapids have used ARPA funding to pilot participatory budgeting. And something that we've really learned, and I think a lot of people who are following a lot of social justice movements can see that a lot of times crisis creates the opportunity for something new. And I think the movement for a people's budget in Cleveland has been an opportunity to use a crisis like the pandemic that's killed over a million people to talk about how do we, how do we innovate and how do we do something new for processes in municipal government. And I think that there's a lot of learning that's gonna come from the cities currently doing PB on how you do that more inclusively. Over the last um, several months, as we've drafted charter amendment language, we have learned a lot from cities that have uh, experimented with participatory budgeting. And we've learned lots of uh, lessons on how to build more equitable processes and building in more ways for people to, to be engaged, whether it's through compensation, whether it's through more time, whether it's through using funding sources that can allow more programmatic expenses for grassroots groups versus just capital funds or just an example. And the, and the photos on this slide and the text on this slide are examples of projects that residents themselves in different cities through community events and processes have pitched ideas for how some of the money in their communities get spent. Things like public restrooms for people who are unhoused to urban, to urban farms, to building improvements and other capital, capital projects for city owned properties that ultimately have a benefit for city residents to playground up to, uh, upgrades. I love some of the photos that some cities use for PB because it looks just like the nerdy science fair that we all wanna be at and a really hands-on way for young people in particular and people who are looking for ways to engage residents in their work of doing civic engagement can kind of reimagine what political participation looks like for people in their communities. Um, now, some of the information on the charter amendment I will say that we have 10 questions coming up, so I'm not going to get to all the information and I, you know, don't want to just like continue talking at this group, but I hope that maybe some of the information that I share about this can help folks understand a little bit of the nuances of, um, of the Charter Amendment. And that is that the Charter Amendment is written for the equivalent of 2% of, of the city's budget every year. And this would give Cleveland residents the, the decision-making power to, to decide how the, that money is prioritized for 2% of the spending. One of the things that we've been trying to convey is that there is a resident a uh, steering committee that acts as a sort of community board of elections that really emphasizes process and emphasizes what do all the steps of the participatory budgeting process look like to make it inclusive for groups that we want to reach and really try to maximize turnout and maximize participation of groups that typically don't uh, participate. And some examples of that are people who are, are residents but not citizens, people who are not registered to vote, um, people who might be teenagers and who are on the cusp of voting age and kind of giving them like a learning lesson of this is how you learn democracy. It's by practicing it. And if you look in some of the, the fine text of the Charter Amendment, there's pretty strong language around the fact that it doesn't make sense to get Central to compete against Detroit Shoreway, Glenville to compete against Old Brooklyn, that we should be taking some metrics around systemic inequality so that, for example, residents living in neighborhoods that have survived redlining would see more dollars per capita than those who live in other parts of the city that don't have the same impacts there. 
Um, and I will say just from like a political standpoint, when it comes to the question of like, how do we pay for this? If, if, if Cleveland has the money to pay for stadium deals that pad the profits of billionaires, then we believe that there's money to meet the needs of res of residents. Um, if you look at the most recent audit that came out from the city of Cleveland, the mayor's estimate shows that there is an annual transfer from the general fund to the stadium fund of $10 million, which will phase out in the next several years once the people's budget would phase in. And there are other sources of funding, such as council discretionary funds, community development block grant dollars, and other sources of funding that kind of align with the sorts of projects that most residents whose basic needs have been failed to be met or they're struggling with could be met by something such as uh, the People's Budget Fund. Um, and I will say, and this is kind of in the weeds, and maybe we'll get to this in some of the questions, is that half of the money of the People's Budget could come from the capital budget. And when we look at what that means, you know, the city can issue bonds to pay for the upfront costs of capital projects that lead to permanent improvement in city infrastructure like streets, parks, and rec centers. And um, this capital budget funds in those relevant categories. But to date, there's really no way for red residents to really influence what the capital expenses the city prioritizes and the people's budget, you know, would seek to, to fix that problem. And it also is really addressing the issue of who really has a seat at the table when decisions around our capital budget are spent. If we look at the fact that the city has been paying back millions of dollars from the general fund to pay for stadium renovations that haven't really seen a direct benefit to um, city residents themselves. And I just want to note too that the money that's allocated to the people's budget fund stays with the city and the city would use that money to implement projects that residents select and that much of that work would be done by unionized city staff. It's not a budget cut. The city has the same amount of money before PB. The charter amendment simply changes who has the power to decide what projects get prioritized. Um, I'm going to change my slide. And, you know, a lot of talk, which we've had, you know, thousands of conversations with residents just trying to get this effort on the ballot is folks have questions about the steering committee that would be appointed to help decide what that open process looks like. And there's language in the charter amendment that if this were to pass, the city administration and council would be legally required to follow around how the selection of that should be determined and it should emphasize young people, local black Asian American, Pacific Islanders, Latinx, Indigenous folks, disabled folks, and working class communities. And, um, you know, really emphasizing the fact that they create a process where residents can vote on projects. It's not the steering committee making the determination on what, what projects are selected. It's residents that should be open to voting on those things. And cities that use a people's budget, you know, usually create a process that is multiple weeks long, a month long. People can vote online, in person, and in schools to help that make more uh, of an inclusive process. Um, and, and just to kind of close out before we get to the Q&A, you know, we think that we build democracy by practicing democracy. We want to build new leaders and a new path to public service when democracy is under threat, especially in Ohio, given the long legacy of gerrymandering and even anti-democratic practices to appointing members and to unit the unit role in city council and things that are factors that I think contribute to some of the mistrust that residents feel uh, around governance in our city. And there is hard data that shows within the city of Cleveland specifically that the idea of collective power resonates more with people who are low propensity voters, that a lot of people living in Cleveland don't know their council member, and that in order to really address the threats to democracy and building collective power, we need to have proactive plans to really say, how are we building on ramps to civic participation to address the fact that most people don't vote, that we want to get more turnout in Cleveland when Sherrod is up next year in 2024. For. And, you know, how are we being creative and really trying to go to the toolbox of democracy to really shift people's understanding of what political participation can look like um, in our city? And how can we do that in an equitable way? And how do we really give a mandate as residents of the city to an administration and council that like, Yes, there are ways that cities have done this that haven't gone well, but we are trying to improve the way that that is done by learning from those cities and how can we try and do that better in a city like Cleveland. 
Um, before I stop sharing my screen, two weeks from today on the 26th at public auditorium, there'll be a public debate uh, with the people's budget. Two members from our steering committee will be debating um, council member Chris Harsh, who I believe is on this call, and another member of the public, I think Jerry Prim. Doors will open at 530. Um, if you want to RSVP for that, put your name in the chat and you know that that will be a public auditorium and folks can park across the hall it's at city at the city council or city hall garage there and i'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can get to some questions um molly i just want to make sure you're going to get me a link to the slideshow so that i could get it to folks tomorrow in yep, the email okay uh, and we will also have a link to the uh, debate that's coming up on the 26th as well. So um, let's start off with the questions. And, and like I said, the, the first 10 questions are going to be the ones that folks submitted ahead of time when they registered for the meeting. And uh, two other people, Dolores Gray and Andre White, um, may be joining Molly for some of the answers. So the first question is... Why does the steering committee have only 11 members when we have 17 wards? And what will you do to make sure that all 17 wards are included? That's a great question. I think a lot of the steering committee composition comes from what cities also using participatory budgeting processes have done and kind of taking into consideration the critical mass of how decision-making uh, takes place. And obviously an odd number accounts for how voting can take place. I think something that's been really important to PB CLE is the fact that people associate home and community in lots of different ways. And wards are political subdivisions that change over time. I know that they'll change in the upcoming future, given the results of the most recent census. And I think that there are other ways that people can kind of conceptualize belonging in a way um, that, that that could be shifted. And, and I know if you look at some of the charter amendment language, uh, the planning commission talks about this idea of statistical planning areas by neighborhood cluster. And we have six planning areas that have essentially four to six neighborhoods that are represented. And a lot of the input around the composition of the steering committee is looking at what has been typical in the hundreds of places that have done participatory budgeting processes in other communities. Okay, next question. If PB CLE seeks to take 2% of the city's budget control away from the council and mayor, why then are the council and the mayor responsible for appointing the steering committee members? I think if you look at some of the legal ramifications of what it means to create a new body within the city, it's very typical that bodies are formed by appointment from city council and from the mayor. I think if you look deeper into the charter amendment, there are other aspects of it that kind of balance out that distribution of power. For example, one of the things that we heard a lot over the last couple of years of organizing is that people are like, well, if city council approves expenditures of above $50,000, why would people spend time investing in a process just for those projects to be turned down once those contracts are before city council? And so written within the charter amendment um, is sort of an exemption of if uh, thousands of Cleveland residents prioritize a specific number of projects. Does it make sense for there to be veto power there? I think for the sake of checks and balances and just given the tight timeline that exists year to year when the mayor mayor's estimate is created for the budget and that goes through council. I think when folks really get to brainstorming, what other ways do selection bodies get created and what sort of time uh, is required to make that process happen. Um, it, it can be a really onerous an onerous process. I think when you're looking at what pro-democracy groups are doing around the world, this concept of civic lottery and sortition is a really popular concept of just doing a sort of lottery draw of citizens taking on a specific type of role. But I, I think in what 
is really required of specific set of residents to kind of serve as a community board of elections is not just jury, jury duty of a week or two. It's a, it's a potential two to three year commitment and it's a time commitment and it's a commitment that, you know, year to year, given the budget cycle takes a certain amount of time that, you know, given that the charter amendment, if issue 38 passes, there's pretty strong language about what the mayor and the administration and city council is advised to do in terms of determining who is on that steering committee to really make sure that representation reflects the community and folks who are not the usual suspects and typical folks who turn, turn out to the process. Okay, next question. If the amendment passes, is the steering committee appointed by council and the mayor, the entity in charge of making the monetary decisions of the people's budget? That's a great question. There are, you know, it's, it's a whole year long process for something like a people's budget. And ultimately, if residents pass issue 38, 2% of the budget, which is equivalent to about $14 million, would be projects that are selected by residents themselves. So the steering committee is responsible for creating a timeline and a process by which residents can, can pitch ideas. Those ideas are vetted into proposals. And then ultimately by neighborhood cluster, they would be put on a ballot and ranked choice voted on how playground improvements or any other projects coming from residents themselves uh, that are eligible, eligible meaning that they abide by, you know, the city state, the, the city and state laws around how public money can be spent. And then residents ultimately vote on those projects. And something I think that's really important for folks to know is I think some people are like, well, couldn't there just be a mechanism where if like Molly wanted to have um, a new park across from her street that she could just get, easily get that done if she's a steering committee member. I think that part of what makes this such a new opportunity for democracy is that people are kind of leaving their idea at the door being like, there could be hundreds of ideas that get submitted. And ultimately there are criteria that are set and these proposals are vetted. And then ultimately these ideas are put on multiple ballots and people prioritize them you know, you there's ha there's a lot of mobilization that needs to happen and, and people can't just guarantee that if they're at the front end of participating in the process that that idea is necessarily going to get on the ballot and that they're kind of placing their trust in a process where they're like one person, one vote. And this is a process where people are putting ideas of things that they care about on a ballot, but that doesn't necessarily like mean that if you're on the steering committee or if you're a budget delegate, around the proposal vetting process that it, it's going to be something that it necessarily wins. And I think that when you look at the multiple forms of democracy that exist, whether it's deliberative, whether it's direct, whether it's representative, there are multiple forms embedded in the process overall that people are kind of trusting in the power of the people and one person, one vote to say that we have faith in the people of Cleveland and that when it comes down to how 2% of our budgets prioritize, this is you know, what people are going to vote on, on how it gets spent. Question number four, is the staff person hired by the mayor to support the PB process the same staff person as the lead coordinator for the steering committee? The role, as it's described in the in the drafted charter amendment, is that the staff liaison is the person who is helping to provide administrative support to the resident led steering committee to shepherd them through the process of uh, generating ideas to vetting proposals to the voting process. And so that same body would likely have a chair and there would be a, a governance structure that maybe most bodies have. And I don't think that there's any scripted language that that staff person, they're just one member of the committee. And in the way that any governance committee would be created and then have staff roles, I don't think that there's any specific guarantee that that person would be the lead person. I think it could, it would be up to that body to decide the different sort of chair roles that that committee would have. Okay, the next question, um, I'm guessing you've heard before, Molly. What are some of the ways that the people's budget could be funded without jeopardizing funding for critical city services if the city faces a budgetary shortfall? Yeah, I, th I, th I think that's a really important question, and I think it really speaks to 
everyday people's knowledge of Cleveland's budget. And I think it speaks to the future of how our city makes funding decisions. I think it's one thing to look at the proposed amendment as it stands in the city in 2023. And I think it's another question to look at what the people's budget means in 2027 when it would be fully implemented. I know that every year the city, if you look at the mayor's estimate and the most recent audit that we're paying anywhere from 10 to $12 million a year to the, the stadium fund. And that depending on how the city moves forward with negotiations for that, that could be um, funding in the city that opens up and that's a source of funding. There's also casino fund dollars, that's discretionary funding for city council. That's not really attached to the general fund, but could be designated if council cho had cho chosen. I will share with this group that last week, the people's budget, our steering committee in particular, agreed to go to the table to negotiate with city council to say, hey, we realize that if Cleveland residents vote to pass issue 38, we have to work with the administration and city council to implement this. And so instead of, you know, deflecting the attention that we should be paying on issue one and marijuana, like let's let's negotiate and go to the table and talk about how we can reach a compromise. And through that effort, which was shepherded by council member Rebecca Moore, um, there were discussions around the fact that how do we create a prioritization effort for how our capital budget is spent? How do we look at some of the federal community development block grant dollars that are more focused on poverty alleviation efforts prioritized for this? And how do we name the funding that could result in a charter amendment that council could have put on the ballot for at least half of what the current edition had? And city council um, was not interested in, in negotiating on those terms and didn't feel like there was time allotted for that. And I think that that kind of like speaks to the frustration that a lot of residents in this coalition felt over the last two years, just trying to get five million of a half a billion dollars to have a pilot for participatory budgeting, that it really wasn't about the money. I think if you're really paying attention to the spaces where decisions about our budget get made, um, we can find money for new developments and for stadium redevelopments and participatory budgeting isn't about like trying to create new money in the budget. It's about creating and bringing a chair to the table about how 2% of our budget gets decided and how that money gets spent in our neighborhoods. And I, I think that, you know, there's 98% of the budget that this doesn't have to do with. I think there are lots of questions around, you know, different programs in the budget and, and how future capital um, dollars are going to be spent that this, isn't something that folks should be alarmed about. And ultimately the, the people's budget fund and the way that the mayor's estimate works and who approves the budget, if there are any cuts made to essential services, those are decisions that are made by city council and the mayor's administration. And I think folks have to decide for themselves when they look at how our city spends it resor its resources, um, if they really believe that um, a prioritization effort of 2% of the budget, if that really will lead to cuts in services. Because I think that the evidence shows over the last 10 years of how our city spends money that, you know, last year CMSD reported over 1,700 homeless students. And there are decisions that we make and there are tax breaks that we give that come from the general fund that pad the profits of people who are wealthy and can seek capital funding um, and financing from other sources that everyday residents of Cleveland can't afford or have access to. Next question. Will the staff person who will be hired for the steering committee position be paid from the initial $350,000 to be allocated for the administrative costs, or will the cost be separate? The, the People's Budget Fund is phased in over a four-year time. So if issue 38 passes on November 7th, the first year would be administrative costs to kind of help plan for the process. And then it would be 1% in 2025, 1.5% in 2026, and then 2% in 2027. And as part of the money allocated to the administrative costs in the first year, that wouldn't be a separate cost. That would be a part of, of the funding. And if you look in the fine print of the charter amendment, you know, the charter is the charter. And we didn't, and, and when the community and partners drafted the charter, amendment language. There were not sources named in the charter amendment because 
I think creating that level of detail of specification means less flexibility over, over time. Um, and we don't really know how things will change over time. And it's ultimately up to the administration and city council to determine the sources of funding, but the money that would cover the staff position for the person would be a part of that initial allocation in year one. Will all of the other costs to hire a staff person, evaluators, community engagement partners, et cetera, come from the administrative costs or from the 2% allocation? It would come from the total allocation and then be decreased. And from what I understand in the charter amendment language, it's up to $500,000. Um, and based on what's drafted in the charter amendment language, the emphasis is on how are we bringing in community groups and organizations and people that are going to help increase engagement and trust building and participation in the process. Okay. Uh Next question, with the Board of Elections not being involved in the voting, how do you prevent fraud? That's a great question. Uh, we are learning a lot and have a lot of resources and different vendors of groups and companies um, a, a, that are involved in open democracy, civic engagement efforts across the world. I think there's kind of this disconnect between how does municipal government and the public sector keep up um, in a society that is like very much privatized and under capitalism, like there's a lot of technology and what are the boundaries and lines and governance around that. And there are a lot of tools and that are used that have been protected and have been successful in the, the many cities that have done participatory budgeting processes within the United States and in other countries to kind of verify that folks participating in the process are indeed residents and have a connection point to the city by which that they're participating in the process. I do know, for example, there was a participatory budgeting pilot in the Collinwood neighborhood and the County Board of Elections had helped in that process to, you know, donate and lend the ballot booths that people were using when they were, were doing that process on Waterloo. I know that Board of Elections and other communities have um, done in-kind printing to help support it. Um, but a lot of this is really trying to conceptualize that like this is government by the people for the people and how are we creating processes and government and engagement that meet the needs to try and increase participation and how can we use tools that help deepen civic engagement in other cities that also like meet the privacy needs and meet some of the, the, the needs around um, security for, for voting. Um, and we're not developing that process on our own. We would be using guidance from companies and, and vendors that work with civic governments and other in municipalities and other cities running these processes. Okay, uh, two more from the one submitted ahead of time. Who are the third party uh, nonprofit implementing partners and who determines who they are? Yeah, I think this is a great question because it really opens up the discussion around what are the decision making powers of the steering committee and how do you balance that with the way that the city um, follows state laws around procurement and doing contracting with organizations that are receiving public funding. And so from our understanding with other cities that do participatory budgeting, there's an RFP process with a time limited response rate where organizations and entities can respond um, to competitively apply to meeting the needs set forth by the steering committee to, to achieve some of the goals there, which would have to do with how those groups can help you know, be trusted groups in the organization, in the community to, to get folks to participate who maybe otherwise wouldn't have. And that in order for them to work with the city, they would have to follow like state laws according to procurement. Um, and it's not, you know, just here's money out to any normal group. Like this is still public funding and would have to follow state laws according to that. And I think we're learning that in real time, you know, just as an example, the community police commission has a discretion to give out community grants. Um, and, and they recently had a grant programming. And I think that there's a lot to learn on, on how citizen led initiatives 
um, can, can bring forth a lot of the wisdom and capacity that grassroots and community-based organizations that are working on civic engagement and deepening participation can ethically um, and transparently do that work with the city to help add value to the process. Okay, um, last question sounds like it comes from a supporter. And it is, is there any way to be involved other than fundraising, phone calls, door knocking? Yeah, uh, I mean, if you're not already subscribed to our email list at pbcle.com, add your email there, put it in the chat. I, I know that there are lots of introverted folks who don't like to knock on doors or make phone calls. We have text messages that you could send. We have postcards that you could send. And there are lots of ways that I think that people and campaigns can add value on an interpersonal level or a way that doesn't involve a ton of interaction that could be really valuable. Um, so reaching out to me, you know, the PBCLE PB coalition at gmail.com, putting your name or email in the chat and subscribing to our website. We're happy to work with anyone who's willing to donate time to the campaign. Okay. Um, Deb, do we see anything in the chat as far as other questions? And I, yeah, we have we have two so far. Um, one is, which city council people did you work with directly? It was Stephanie House, Deborah Gray, Rebecca Moore, and Jenny Spencer. Yeah, no, I think it, this is for the negotiations. Oh, sorry, for the negotiation, it was Rebecca Moore, who had kind of led the communication between the council president and members of the PB Clee Coalition. Okay, we have another one. Um, why do you think some members of council are reacting so harshly towards your efforts? Could this be ascribed to their fear of loss of influence or control, or is it just simply their lack of faith in our neighbors? Yeah, I think those are legitimate questions. You know, as someone who has like a public policy background, I think that there are lots of legitimate concerns around how do municipalities and resident led groups try to improve processes, you know, I, I really am much brought to this process because I'm deeply concerned about um, who controls our democracy, you know, at the state level, na national level, and even city level. And I think that if you're, you know, representing the people of Cleveland, you're really kind of supposed to be aligned. You know, I don't think that when it comes down to it, that the, the project ideas that come from residents should really be all that different from what council people would approve anyways. And I think that given the history of our timeline with the pilot, with ARPA funding, to our failed negotiation effort, it's just really hard to to justify that this is about physical concerns of the city when it seems to be that it's about power and who has power. Um, and, you know, I, I really have been surprised that that people on council who oppose this idea, like haven't brought up more concerns that I've felt working at a nonprofit organization that's worked with the city around timing and, and how that process goes. I think that, um, when it comes down to it, it's, and we've heard this from other cities too. They say a lot of times council members don't like participatory budgeting because they feel like it is, uh, builds the bench for more progressive candidates who might compete against council people. And I think that this really, when you're really creating processes that are trying to increase more transparency around where decisions get made at the city and who gets to participate and how those decisions get made, I think it really exposes um, people's individual interests on, 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 on having positions of power. And I think like anything change is hard. This is going to be a new process. And I think it makes sense for someone who's worked with the city for a long time to be like, I don't know how this is going to work. And I think that there that's valid and there should be humility in that. And I don't think that that should prevent us from trying something new, especially when for so long, the same things we've been doing haven't been working. Um, but I think that it's not PB Clee's responsibility to answer those questions. People should be answering, you know, asking council people them themselves why they don't and and I'll just be frank like I've learned a lot as a resident you know I'm I make most of my money you know playing the violin at funerals and weddings and doing hospice stuff and a lot of this is in my free time and I grew up working poor and working class and I'm committed to spending time on building power for Cleveland residents and building social justice movements and it takes a lot of time and I think we have to recognize that there are a lot of people in Cleveland 
who want things to be different for their community and they don't know how to get that done. And I think that when there's energy to say, how do we shift the way political participation looks like and how do we reinvent that process and create energy for it, that we should be on board for that. Um, and I'm really excited about, you know, regardless of what happens in November, this is elevating the type of narrative and conversation that we're having. And that I don't know, I don't think I've ever like seen or participated in a public debate that happened at public auditorium. And I think if we're creating the sort of civil discourse where people can have these conversations, ask the hard questions and be in this forum, like that's what I'm here for. And like, that's like the gift of democracy in our community. Um, and I look forward to representing PV Clee in future conversations and for there to be more platforms for people to ask council people themselves about why they don't support it or why they find it to be a bad idea or threatening to them. How can you make sure that funds are distributed equitably? How can you make sure that the poor communities are not left out if this is to pass? I think that there's a really large mandate when issue 38 passes for city council and the mayor to really think about, you know, how are we creating a process where that's the case? And I think that there's strong language in the charter amendment that really details who should serve on the steering committee and what sort of sort of values that that process should embody. You know, I think something that's really interesting that's unfolding is a lot of PB processes that have been done in other cities have been led by council members who use their discretionary funds within a specific district. And we're talking about doing a process that's mandated in a city charter in a city that is half people of color and where a third of residents are making under $15,000 a year. And I think that when you look at the data of like where people live, how often they move, who's homeless, who's not, if we really feel like our goal is to reach people who don't have like a say and we have resources and time to put towards that effort, then then we should feel like the mandate to do that should be something where people who haven't participated before or who should participate in that process that those out, that that outreach effort and the goal of that shouldn't be so so hard to achieve. So our next question is, is there a chance that this will just teach everyday people austerity, only certain projects can be chosen, tough choices must be made, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I don't talk about a lot, but I think that this should appeal to members of city council in particular is that I think that I think that in, in this process of getting this on the ballot, there hasn't been an appreciation for the fact that like people who don't have trust in government are like putting their trust in government by saying, we think that this process should happen. And I think part of participating in a process like this, where a, a thousand ideas is going to result in 30, means that a lot of people who had an initial idea or a different part to play in the process ultimately didn't get what they want. And I think that's part of the learning experience of living in a country where you have as many people as we do and it comes down to how does that representation play out and how can you know the process of a people's budget help increase that representation and be a tool for getting more people involved in the decision making process um and, and it does come down to making trade-offs and how is that a learning by doing experience for people who are invested in that process um, because, you know, just to be frank, like, I think it's really hard to like live in a city like Cleveland and to see as many people working at city hall, council members, staff, people or otherwise being as committed as they are and having, you know, as many residents as we do, you can't meet people's needs completely. And what does it mean to live in a society with scarce resources that maybe are, you know, systemically designed to be so, but like, how are we teaching residents who are trying to build engagement in a city that works for them kind of have to confront some of the trade-offs that come in everyday decision-making? And what does it mean for people to participate in that sort of process and to learn in real time about what that means? And what does it mean to place trust in everyday residents who can participate that and, and trusting that the way that the public would vote on ideas in their neighborhoods would ultimately value residents as much as a representative who is representing them as a council person or you know, our government overall. Okay, how many people are needed to make PV successful? I think that's an open-ended, I think that's an open-ended question because 98% of the budget is technically approved by 17 people. So I would say having a hundred people is greater than 17. And we're talking about for a, a smaller number. Um, 
I I don't think that yeah, I, I mean, I think greater than 17, really, if we're if we're really breaking it down, I would love to see a scenario where if we have 30 percent turnout, you know, are we are, are we are we really defining success as people who vote in presidential election or municipal elections? Or are we really creating a set of standards and criteria by which people who have never voted are participating in a process as a sign of progress, if that means that they have a new connection point to a sense of community? What are the one or two most important lessons you've learned from other cities' experiences with participatory budgeting? You know, I think what we learned from some other cities that have done participatory budgeting is that, um, you know, when it comes to running the process, a lot of times capital expenditures are the most appealing because they're one-time costs. They're things that people can see with their eyes. But when you're trying to do it from like a racial equity standpoint, like people want more services and they want more programs and people want longstanding commitments. Like, you know, I, I've been a part of a process where for two years we've been trying to get $5 million, right? And what does it mean for a community that's like trying to, to build power and elevate the voices of people that, who don't have everything they need to continuously go back like year and year again? Um, and, and I think, you know, something that we learned is that groups are really interested in, in institutionalizing long-term financial dedication to something like PB, because you really can't build capacity or create process or sustainability for something unless there's a dedicated funding stream, which is why the people's budget was looking at how the city charter can be something that's a mandate that can institutionalize um, a form of direct democracy and participation year after year. We don't have any more questions. Okay, how about going once, going twice? Last call on questions. Anything you'd like to add as kind of a closing statement, Molly? Well, two weeks today is the debate public auditorium. It would be really great if folks could turn out for that. If you're interested in canvassing with us in making phone calls, just having a conversation, please go to pbclee.com and to subscribe. And um, yeah, I'm really grateful for folks tuning in. And um, it's been a learning experience for me and it's been a really great opportunity to figure out what does it look like to build like multiracial, multi-generational community organizing in the city around a type of environment where usually people are like homelessness, education, food access and all these different things, but we're really talking about something more fundamental, which is like, where do decisions get made? Um, where does power lie within the city? And how can we build collective power um, so that we live in a city where the city's safe because everyone has the resources that meet their needs? That's the ultimate vision. Um, on the debate, Molly, it, for folks who can't make it down, is it gonna be live streamed anywhere? Yes, we're in the process of that. Our, we're fingers crossed trying to partner with the city club to live stream it. But if we can't, we will have volunteers and, and um, a live stream option so that it's recorded. And if it's not live streamed, a recording will be available after the fact to increase accessibility to people who can't. And according to the chat, TV20 will carry it. So that's really great news. Well, TV20 is only in Cleveland though, right? They, they, are... live, they live broadcast on YouTube. Oh, okay. Okay, that's right. Okay. YouTube is everywhere, Steve. I know. Well, CCPC has our own YouTube channel. So, so, so um, okay. Thank you very much, Molly. Um, let's give Molly a round of applause for sitting here and, and just going nonstop with all these rapid fire questions. And thank you for coming tonight. Um, not sure yet what we're doing in October, um, but stay tuned. I, I know most of you guys are getting our emails and uh, we'll let you know as soon as we know. Take care. Good night.